Fun Kids Science Weekly with Starfell, Willow Moss and the Forgotten Tale. Willow, the youngest and least powerful sister in a family of witches, recently saved the world. The problem is, nobody can remember it. Missing out on your summer holidays this year? Well, why not go on a sound journey with Maddie Moat and discover the exciting sounds of science and nature from the comfort of your own home? In each podcast episode, Maddie is joined by experts to guide you on all kinds of journeys into a beehive, down the plug hole, or even up into a cloud. And along the way, you'll help Maddie create a new piece of music made from the noises you discover. Listen out for interesting sounds as you go along. You'll be going to some very interesting places because sound explorers can go anywhere. The first five episodes are available to listen to now. So what are you waiting for? Just search for Maddie's Sound Explorers wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. This is officially the greatest podcast in the history of the universe, which is nice because it's also the only podcast that takes you all across the universe to learn some of the amazing sciencey secrets that are lurking inside. Now, this week, we're talking about something used in jewellery that has an almost Harry Potter-style curse upon it. Also, you can hear why scientists have been looking inside mummified animals and they're not unwrapping them. You can hear how they're doing that in a little bit. And we'll talk about what Greta Thunberg has been doing in her year away from school. Plus, your science question could be answered in a sec. Today, they're on jellyfish, seeing things and breathing. That is happening next. Stay there. First, we're catching up with Karina and her science superhero alter ego, K-Mystery. K-Mystery. Elements in danger. It's kind of cool having a superhero alter ego. They're great to get us out of danger, right? At your service. Although, right now, it's the elements we use in our mobile phones that are in danger. Some of them are set to run out in the next 100 years. Can you imagine that? No phones? Um, chemistry? What elements are in danger? Come on, I'll show you. Let's start by getting to know the six most rare elements that we rely on in our gadgets. First is... Oh, let me guess. It's got a really bonkers chemistry name like hamburger oleum or catastophagen? Nope. It's something you already know the name of. You're wearing it right now, in fact. I'm wearing it? I'm wearing a hoodie. Hoodie Liam? No, silver. Silver? You mean, like my rings? There's silver in my phone. That's right. Silver's an element that's used for lots of things, not just jewellery. Let's get inside your phone and see for ourselves. Keep hold of me! Can you see the circuit board below? Yeah! It's like a landscape! All the circuits look like fields! There's so many! Hang on! We're going down! Look there! Where the circuits meet! Something's shining! Is that silver? Spot on! Tiny amounts, but it's there and in tons of our gadgets! Who knew my phone was so bling? It's nothing to do with trying to be fancy! Silver's just really great at a whole bunch of stuff. Did you know it can even be used to kill bacteria? In your phone, it's perfect because it's great at conducting electricity. So you're saying we can't just go and get some more? Not easily. There's not much more to be found and it's really hard to mine. Come on, let's see how they do it. Hold tight. Although you can sometimes find chunks of silver in the ground, most of the silver we use starts off mixed up with lots of other elements in layers of rock deep underground. Here, in the Earth's crust, molten rock pushes its way to the surface, melding different elements together. But how do you sort out the different elements in rock? Break it apart? All the elements are so tightly bonded together, it's not quite that easy. There are huge mines like this in many places across the world, in Mexico, Peru, China and Russia. The rocks are crushed into dust and processed for a long time to get the minerals we want. It's a lot of work for not much silver. Can't they find new mines? You can try, but you'd need to take lots of samples before you can decide if there was enough silver 
in the samples to go to all the trouble of setting up a mine. That can take years. Years? We might not have. And at the moment, it's looking like we'll run out of silver in... Less than 100 years. Wow. What are we going to do? There's plenty you can do. More gadgets mean more elements are needed. So simply buying fewer phones and tablets, well, we could start preserving resources that we have. Sharing and reusing technology you don't need anymore and recycling them when they're broken. Some of these rare elements can be recovered and used again. So you're saying if I help out, I'm kind of being a chemistry superhero too, just like you. No one is just like me, Karina. But you'll be the next best thing. Thanks, K-Mystery. K-Mystery, Elements in Danger, with support from the Royal Society of Chemistry. Find out more and get hands-on with chemistry at funkidslive.com slash chemistry. Right, it's time to get some of your questions answered then. This is my favourite part of the show where you get yourself to Apple Podcasts, if that's how you're listening. Uh, You leave us a review. You find the Science Weekly on there. There's a little comment box at the bottom. That is where you leave uh, the question. There's something sciencey that's been niggling around your brain. You leave it there so I can do all the detective work for you. Uh, This is from two people, actually. Two separate questions, both on the same thing, which is nice and handy. Tezzers and Emily, who is three years old, ask... How does a jellyfish stay alive with no brain, no blood, no heart? And actually, why are they called jellyfish? Well, jellyfish's skin uh, is so thin, they absorb oxygen right through it, so they don't need lungs. They don't have any blood, so they don't need the oxygen to oxygenate their blood. They just kind of need it to stay alive and float around. But because they don't have any blood, they don't need a heart. Their nerves are so close to the skin as well, they can react to the environment that they're in straight away. So they don't need a brain to think through any complex stuff. They're quite simple creatures. Uh, They're quite simple creatures, jellyfish. Just floating around looking for plants or fish eggs to eat. Uh, I mean, they're called jellyfish because, well, they look a little bit like jelly, don't they? Thank you very much for that, you two. Uh, Here is a question from Sweaty Pigeon. Nice name, who asks, uh, how do you see things? Now, what happens there, Sweaty Pigeon? I'll call you Sweaty. Is that all right? Good. What happens there, Sweaty, is that light enters the eye through the cornea, which is a clear window right in front of the pup- uh, right in front at uh, the front of the eye. This reflect- refracts light, which means it bends it in a way that it can get all the light that's in front of you into the tiny space of the pupil in your eye. You've also got the iris, which works a little bit like a shutter in a camera. It makes the image bigger and s- or smaller and easier to understand. And then what happens is all that light that you've taken in in those amazing ways hits the retina at the back of the eye, which then splits it into many parts. Uh, there's a macula, which is like a bullseye right in the middle of the retina. It's got all the photoreceptors you need. They are nerve endings, and they convert that light that you've taken in into electrical signals, which are understood by your brain. You might listen, need to listen to that again. There's a lot going on there, but thank you very much for the question. Uh, and lastly today, we've got something from someone who calls themselves Stuck at Home Fan Number One. Stuck at Home is another one of the brilliant podcasts that we do at Fun Kids. You can listen to that and our brand new Activity Quest one, wherever you get your shows. Get some ideas to keep you busy. Uh, they ask, if you went in a rocket, how many miles upwards would you need to go before you ran out of oxygen? Not that far, really. The problem is oxygen is very heavy, which means it sinks and lighter gases that you don't need rise up. Now, this is an issue when you're climbing mountains because there's not enough oxygen around for you a lot of the time. So you start to get sick. Now, scientists think that when you get higher than six miles up in the air, you won't be able to breathe enough oxygen in and you will hyperventilate. So six miles. Not that much, 10k. Uh, thank you very much for the question. If you've got something science that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, it turns out Vikings may have spread one of history's most deadly diseases, as scientists have found evidence of smallpox in Viking remains. Professor Eski Villaslev is from Cambridge University. He led the study, and he's on the show to tell us more. Hey, Eski. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Can we start? Can you just tell us a little bit more about what smallpox is or was because we've eradicated it now? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's a virus and uh, it has been very devastating uh, throughout history. I mean, it caused more human death 
uh, than all other infectious diseases together. So I think it's estimated just within the last 100 years, it's about 500 million people who died from uh, smallpox. So it's a, it's a very dangerous disease and it's causing these kind of blisters uh, across the body uh, created by the virus. And we, uh, we eradicated it back in 1980, didn't we? Yes, we did. So today, uh, it, there's two labs in the world, I, guess, I believe one in the US and one in Russia, that still hold some strains of smallpox. Otherwise, it's uh, one of two uh, infectious diseases that we have managed uh, to uh, eliminate altogether. And now Vikings come into play, 40 years after we last had record of it in the world. What, what gave you an inkling that there might be a link with Vikings and smallpox, Eski? Well, Why did you start looking? Well, it was actually part of a, another study. We were studying the, the migrations of the Vikings, uh, and this is another paper that will come out uh, fairly soon. But then we are, at the same time, when we are extracting DNA, genetic material from these human remains, we are also screening them for all known uh, pathogens. And uh, by simply comparing the sequence reads to sequence reads of known pathogens. And there we then discovered, uh, to our surprise, that a number of the Vikings were actually infected uh, by uh, something that looks like smallpox. And um, this is uh, the oldest evidence of smallpox found. I mean, there has been, uh, you can say, assumptions of earlier smallpox, for example, in Egyptian mummies. But it has never been, uh, you can say, it's never been confirmed, uh, you know, so it's just based on, uh, you can say, how the, the body look that people have said, well, this might look like smallpox. So the oldest virus that existed uh, until this study was um, from around the 1600s. And uh, so this is going way further back in time. And it was a, it was a big surprise to us. Another thing that surprised us was it's actually a, a clade of smallpox. It's a form of smallpox that we didn't know about before. So it's not the same as we see in historical individuals, uh, but it has probably been just as lethal as uh, the one we know from later periods. You say it's a different type of smallpox, maybe a different strain. Yes. What are the similarities in it then when you're, when you're looking it up, when you're looking for pathogens? Uh, well, it's it's um, right. it's kind of different in the sense that uh, it's it's simply falling. Uh, if you make a phylogenetic tree, you can you can see it looks different. And uh, you know what has seems to have happened uh, since the Viking times is that there's a reduction, if you want, uh, of the genome of the smallpox. So it's actually losing a number of traits, if you want, that that seems to have been present in the Viking smallpox. Tell me more about the surprise that you felt, Eski. I would imagine being a scientist, leading a study, doing research, and then you make this uh, pretty significant discovery. Tell us, uh, had you any ideas that you might, that something like this might crop up? Uh, no, uh, I mean, it, but I would say from our previous research, when we look into ancient pathogens, I mean, I think we get one surprise after the other. I mean, for a couple, a few years ago, we found evidence of of plague epidemics, for example, that was uh, three thousand years older than what anybody thought of, uh, and with hepatitis B, which is another viral pathogen, uh, you know, we found evidence of it being present in Europe almost 5,000 years ago, and there are many researchers have argued, you know, it had only been there in Europe for 500 or 600 years. So it really tells us how little we know about these uh, infectious diseases. And uh, this is where I think it's not only historically uh, relevant, but it's actually also potentially relevant for for developing, uh, I think, uh, and and predicting how these diseases will behave in in the future. I mean, if you take things like smallpox, yes, it's uh, it's been eliminated uh, beside these two labs where it exists, but there's still pox viruses in other animals, you know, from monkeys and cows. And of course, what people are afraid of is that these uh, poxes should be jumping 
uh, to humans, just as we have seen with the corona outbreak, right? And uh, in that regard, it's important to know as much as we can about uh, the evolution uh, of of uh, of these diseases, how they change through time, and this is where you know these past uh, genetic strains they they basically give us a catalog over what uh, what kind of mutations, if you want, what kind of changes can these pathogens carry and still be viable and effective. And, uh, you know, if something has been uh, viable and effective in the past, it's only a matter of time, then it will in some degree reappear. So this is an opportunity for us to say, you know, uh, for pathogens in general, well, do the vaccines uh, we currently have, do they, uh, can they handle, you know, these strains that were in the past and likely will reappear at some point, right? And uh, it also gave us information of what regions in the, in the genome of these pathogens one should look at when monitoring, you know, changes um, through time and space. So it's actually quite valuable. Now, back 1,500 years or so ago, um, when the Vikings would have been you know, ruling m- much of Europe, particularly around the North Sea, was there... W- w- was it a particularly, I'm trying to think of what would the environment, there we go, would the environment have been uh, perfect for, for diseases and pathogens like smallpox to spread? Were they living particularly dirtily? Um, was, was, it quite a, was it quite a filthy, misty, foggy place? <laughs> well, I think it was actually in many, in many places, it was quite similar to today. I mean, there's a period where it gets a little bit colder and then, but but it's uh, of course as you say as you point to I mean the way people were living there was no sewage right I mean uh, and uh, they probably also had a much poorer understanding of how uh, the pathogens were spreading right smallpox is spreading by saliva for example I mean you have you can actually infect people similar to corona I mean you have to keep a distance right and they were probably not aware of that and um, and uh, so therefore it spread and of course with the Vikings traveling across Europe I mean they were basically uh, you can say most likely super spreaders of of uh, of the smallpox and probably also other diseases talking about those other diseases lastly Eski, mm. do, do we have an idea of other diseases that might have been around back then which have since naturally been eradicated not eradicated uh, because uh, there's not that many diseases that have been, been totally eradicated but i mean what we see what we also find in the vikings i think like leprosy for example is very common uh, uh, and also uh, uh, you know plague pestis um, is is very common. I mean, so there's no doubt that that uh, you know infectious diseases that are very severe and very very bad for you was uh, you know reasonable abundant uh, during that time. So uh, you know there was stuff to fear, and of course a number of these diseases we can we can treat today. Uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know pestis. Uh, causing plague, I mean, is actually something that you still see appearing, uh, you still see in infected individuals today in the US and China, for example, through rod- rodents. But of course, we can treat it if you if it's discovered uh, fast enough, you know, you can treat it, right? So, uh, but back then, I mean, it was... Uh, uh, there it, it would have been uh, causing a lot of death. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on to tell us more. Professor Eski Villaslev from Cambridge University. Thank you so much, Eski. Willow Moss and the Forgotten Tale is a wonderful book. It's packed with fun, inventive magic, lovable characters as well. It's the anticipated second book in the 2019 breakout magical fantasy series, Starfell starring misfit witch Willow Moss. It's beautifully illustrated throughout by Sarah Warburton. Uh, When her own powers are out of control, can Willow and her friends once again save the day and rescue sometimes? This is a perfect read if you're aged eight or older, uh, and it's available in paperback from the 3rd of September in all good bookshops, supermarkets, and online. It's time for this week's Dangerous Dan, which makes pretty deadly jewellery 
The rosary pea, or Abrus precatorius, is a small plant. Uh, it's got red seeds that hang and droop down. You find it across Asia and Australia. Uh, now, it, I called it rosary pea, but it's also known by many names. Uh, uh, Jequiriti, uh, wild licorice, uh, jumbi bead, crab's eye. Uh, and it's often used in necklaces and bracelets because it looks pretty, but that's a problem. Because they look striking, and they also look quite delicious. They look like something that a a young baby might want to bite into. And that's a terrible idea because these seeds seeds contain the deadly toxin abrin. It's two times more lethal than ricin, which we've spoken about before. Uh, Now, it's like something from Harry Potter, this thing. It causes like a wicked curse. Just a few bites, a couple of chomps on this rosary pea uh, will cause days of being sick and convulsing and rising, writhing about before liver failure. And then you die. Uh, It's got such a delightful name as well, doesn't it? The Rosary P. It's not a delight. It's amazingly deadly. It's time to catch up with one of our favourite inventors on the show now. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. Oh, hello. Sir Sidney McSprocket here. It's great to see you. Especially as we're looking at some great British minds. Creative people who use their imagination to design, invent and adapt the things around us. Things we use every day. Now, there have been great minds for as long as there have been human beings. And in 1851, a great exhibition was held in London to celebrate and showcase some of the very best. People such as Eugene Rimmel. Rimmel was a perfume maker who was born in France, but lived in England for most of his life. At the Great Exhibition, he created a giant fountain that sat atop of a splendid base featuring glass cases filled with bottles of Great Exhibition Bouquet Perfume. If the stylish bottles didn't convince people to hand over their money, then ladies could try the perfume on their handkerchief by asking for a spritz from the fountain itself. Now, you might recognise Eugene Rimmel's name. Although he died in 1887, the cosmetics brand that he created, Rimmel London, is still sold around the world. You see, he didn't stop at one invention. Just like another great British mind, and one who's still inventing today, Sir James Dyson. Now, you might have heard of Dyson as a type of vacuum cleaner, and the dual cyclone is certainly the invention for which Sir James is best known. Oh, oh, hang on, let me just switch this off. Not really the time for it. Oh, that's better. But you see, Sir James's story didn't start with the cyclone. Before that, he invented something else, something very different. I wonder if you can guess what it was. It was a wheelbarrow, or rather, a ball barrow. He had noticed that wheelbarrows had a tendency to get stuck in the mud. His idea was that a ball-shaped wheel would be less likely to sink, and thus the ball barrow was born. And without the ball barrow, there might never have been his famous vacuum cleaner. He'd seen another problem, you see, and thought he might be able to figure out a fix. Traditional vacuum cleaners had a tendency to clog up and lose their suction. Now one day, Sir James had an idea that the air filters they used to spray the paint on the wall ball barrows could be used to make a bagless type of vacuum cleaner. And he didn't stop there. After all, if you can suck, then you can also blow. A few years later, Dyson launched the Airblade, a hand-drying machine which produces a single layer of cool air travelling at 400 miles per hour, faster than a jet. Dyson has also created high-powered hair dryers and even adapted his digital motor technology to make medical ventilators. 
as you can see, a part of what makes a great mind is the ability to be adaptive, like Sir James. Take an idea from one invention and using it for another. And it's a leaf I've taken from his book. I've got this whisk from an ice cream machine and thought it would make a tremendous propeller for some rocket shoes I've been working on. Let's give them a try. Why? Up, up and away. I'll have to catch you another time. Tatty bye for me. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. With support from the Royal Commission 1851. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash mixprocket. It's time for this week's Science in the News. Three mummified animals from ancient Egypt have been digitally unwrapped and researched using 3D scans. A snake, a bird and a cat, they're in Swansea University's massive Egypt collection they've got there. They're thought to be at least 2,000 years old and they were wrapped up and they were mummified. But using micro scanners, scientists were able to see inside the creature's remains, see how they were killed and the ritual that was used to mummify them. They've learned loads more about the history with this. Also, scientists say that painting one blade of a wind turbine black could cut bird strikes by 70%. It's a huge problem with wind turbines that are all white. Birds tend to fly into them and they don't come out of that altercation all too well. Now scientists say that painting one blade black should help with that. The thing is the RSPB say that the priority really shouldn't be painting anything black at all. It should be putting the turbines simply where there isn't a risk to birds. And finally Greta Thunberg has gone back to school. Uh, She took a year off to raise awareness of the climate crisis. In that time, she's been busy. She's sailed to America, uh, sailed on down to Mexico. She's told off the president. She's told off the UN. And now she's got a year of schoolwork to catch up on. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening, for finding us, for downloading us, for streaming us, for telling everyone that you know which you are doing right. Good. If you've got a science question, by the way, that you want answered on the show, you need to find the Fun Kids Science Weekly on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review in the comment box below. Make sure you leave your name as well so I can say hello and give us five stars. That will really help me see it. While you're on Apple Podcasts, it's one of the best places that you can hear, see all of our brilliant podcasts that we do from Fun Kids. We've got loads there. We've got some on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com as well. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen to us all over the country on your DAB digital radio, on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. Kids Science Weekly with Starfell, Willow Moss and the Forgotten Tale. Willow, the youngest and least powerful sister in a family of witches, recently saved the world. The problem is, nobody can remember it. 